Blog Talk Radio. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen, across the uh, airwaves. We're so blessed to have you. It's Tuesday, and I always get excited for this. I call it the Rust Belt Reports, and the reason being, it's Cleveland Starts It, the American Sports History Podcast, hosted by my good friend, brother, mentor, Peter Ray. We follow this one by the uh, 412, the All Access Pittsburgh Podcast. David Finoli and uh, Chris Fletcher got that one coming up right after. So it's more of those guys and less of me. So as I get these things out, 347-205-9631, send your questions, comments. Catch the archive on blogtalkradio.com forward slash Mancini Sports Podcast platforms, wherever you subscribe to, powered by Mancini Media. So without further ado, as I lay the red carpet down, as I put the podium in its place and hand off the mic, first of all, Peter, how are you? Second of all, how can people get a hold of you? And third, it just seems like another great guest comes on your great show, my friend. Hi, Mark. I'm doing very well. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. It's my name, Peter J. Ray, R-E-A. You know, I was speaking to our guest uh, several nights ago, and he was thanking me for the opportunity of being on the show. And I thought, well, he ought to be thanking Mark Mancini. And as I thought more about it, I thought I need to be thanking Mark Mancini uh, the show, American Sports History, has been running for a year and a half, and tonight's guest is our 71st guest, so it's just been a wonderful experience, opportunity, and I just want to uh, uh, thank Mark Mancini. He's the he's the guy who keeps bringing these amazing guests week after week and producing the show and this uh, tremendous network that he's put put together of uh, sports podcasts. Uh, you're absolutely right, Mark, about tonight's guest uh, he is uh, his. Uh, he's really a, a, knows a lot about boxing, uh, hockey, and MLB, Major League Baseball. Uh, his father was a his father was an umpire, college baseball and semi pro. He grew up uh, uh, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, had 39 years in commercial banking. Now he's looking to get into the um, uh, sports media business, and I think he's got a very bright future because he's very knowledgeable and, and articulate and uh, personable. And uh, so, welcome to the show, Mr. Gary Kinn. Thank you very much, Peter. I appreciate you having me on. And I also uh, wish to thank Mark Mancini for including me in any part of his uh, his network here. So, I, uh, I we were as we said on the phone, I was all set to uh, start talking about MLB 70s. You brought up the Baltimore Orioles, but we'll hold off on that for a while. My son, I, my son Tim, I mentioned <coughs> that I we've got a boxing expert on, and my son is really into boxing, so he, he had a few questions that I'd like to ask you, Gary. The first is, <coughs> excuse me, what are your thoughts about the Tyson Fury Deontay Wilder fight coming up in uh, four days, October ninth? I'm very, uh, I'm very excited about it, and I think uh, most people who follow boxing closely, Peter, are as well. Uh, this actually has been and will be a very interesting trilogy. I mean, uh, for those who follow boxing closely, uh, Tyson Fury's been on the radar for quite some time. Uh, Emmanuel Stewart, the great trainer out of the Cronk Gym in Detroit, had talked about uh, Tyson Fury years ago before anybody really knew who he was in the U.K. Uh, you know, at six foot nine, 250 to 270 pounds and can move and box, he's a very, very difficult proposition for anyone. And Deontay Wilder is probably underrated in the sports history in terms of his KO power at 6'7", 230 or so himself. His 41 wins had 40 knockouts to start, and he pretty much had beaten everybody put in front of him, and rather decisively. But all of a sudden he runs into Tyson Fury, who a lot of people originally thought would be run, run right through by Wilder. It didn't happen. In the first fight, it was an excellent fight, a boxing match that went back and forth with Fury controlling a lot more of the pace. Wilder put Fury down in the eighth round, and in the twelfth round, the last time with 40 seconds to go, it didn't look like Fury would get up, but he got up, and he was fighting back at the bell. And then the decision was controversial, which sometimes helped the sport. It was a complete split draw. One judge had it completely equal at 113-113. One judge had it for Wilder. One judge had it for Fury. So uh, the first fight was an excellent fight, and one that if anybody hasn't watched any of this trilogy before this weekend. It's being run on Fox Sports Journal. They should check it out. The second fight took a little while to get negotiated. The pandemic hurt it. 
Uh, I think there were some negotiations between the teams as well that had broken down a couple times. It always happens in boxing because of dueling promotion. But Fury basically came in about 30 pounds bigger, over 270 pounds in the fight. And everybody thought that, again, he had lost his focus like he had done previously after he had defeated Vitaly Klitschko in 2015. But Fury said, oh, no, no, I have a plan here. And I felt something in the previous fight. Nobody really knew what he was talking about, but it was clear what it was. He came right after Wilder. He had he had Wilder backing up, which was unusual in, in, in Wilder's. He did hit Wilder with a punch that was borderline behind the ear and in the back of the head. It did really stun Wilder. He started bleeding in the ear, which usually indicates inner ear damage or some other damage. And from that point on, Fury continued to batter him around the ring till Mark Breland, Wilder's former trainer, stopped the fight before the seventh round began. So there's controversy in both fights, but both were super competitive. In the third fight, I think we have a lot of interesting elements. I mean, what will Fury do? Will he try to box this time, or will he come right after Wilder again? He will be the bigger man by two inches. He'll be bigger in reach by two inches, and he outweighs Wilder generally by about 25 pounds. Wilder's been very quiet this promotion up until the last few days. He showed some training videos, but I think he has decided to hunker down more than he traditionally does, not worry about selling the fight and being coming in prepared. And he looked very good in the videos that are out there on on the various Internet sites. Um, you know, Wilder does have a better chin than people realize, and he did put Fury down hard in these fights. Fury did that as well, but Fury's punch was borderline. I think it's going to be quite a competitive battle here in the in this fight, and I think there's going to be a lot of action early. That would be my prediction. I'm looking forward to it. As far as the prediction is concerned, hard to say. Still have to think about it. I think I think I still put my uh, my money on Fury a little bit, though, and the reasons are this. Fury won a boxing match the first time in a lot of people's eyes, although the judges didn't see it as anything but the but the split draw. The second time, he proved that he could hurt Wilder and walk right through him. So Wilder also changed trainers late in the process. He went to Malik Scott, who's a former heavyweight that Wilder defeated himself. Scott does get high regards from a lot of the famous trainers around boxing, but he hasn't ever been in a fight this big. Fury's camp's changed a little bit too, but he's with Sugar Hill, who was with him the last time. Sugar Hill was interesting, Emmanuel Stewart's protege. Sugar Hill was with him the last time he had beaten Wilder earlier this year. So Fury has a little bit less chaos outside the ring and a little bit less adjustment than it appears Wilder has. But I think it's going to be a very interesting fight, and I think it fits in pretty strongly in heavyweight history as important trilogy, as an important trilogy, rather. Randy from Corpus Christi, Texas, is listening. Welcome, Randy. Uh, Randy says the Dallas Cowboys are looking good. He wants to talk about what's just starting right now, the Boston Red Sox, New York Yankees, in a one-game play wild, uh, wild card playoff. And uh, that's uh, it's interesting because they seem like the everybody seems to want an ALCS Red Sox-Yankees, but there's only one game, so... Uh, and this, uh, Randy is thinking, why? How come it ought to be two out of three? What are your thoughts on tonight's game, Red Sox Yankees, uh, uh, Gary? I mean, hard to say. I think both teams really had a lot of chances to put that that race away earlier. I felt, and they kind of let Seattle and Toronto back in. I mean, the Yankees are an odd team. They have a lot of power. Uh, they can hit the ball out of the park. They don't really run the bases very well, and they don't really catch the ball very well, which is unusual for a Yankee team. I think the Red Sox uh, also kind of stumbled in here a little bit. I mean, the game's in New York, which and I don't know how much that means. I think if I had to if I had to place a bet in this, I think I think if I think if the Red Sox get out early, I think they win, which isn't real you know real rocket science here. I think if the game gets late and it's close, you know what I've seen of the Yankees games down the stretch. Chapman is throwing the ball really well again. You really struggle around July 4th. I think if the game's close and he can come in with the lead or the game tied late, I'd probably put my money on the Yankees. Eric from Covina, California. Welcome to the show, Eric. He, uh, Eric asks about Danny Little Red Lopez, if you have any thoughts, if you remember him, any thoughts on him? I don't remember him extremely well because I was fairly young at that time in the 70s, but, I mean, I know, you know he's, he's an all-time great. He was certainly, uh, you know, we were talking uh, in the past about action fighters. I mean, Danny Little Red Lopez was certainly that. I mean, he was a he was he was really in very good shape for the fights that I've seen of his. Um, you know, he threw a lot of punches. He could take a shot too, and he seemed to get better as the, as the fights rolled on. I mean, he's certainly an all-time great. Don from Kensington, Pennsylvania, welcome to the show, Don. Uh, he's uh, 
hoping for or predicting a Do- uh, L.A. Dodgers, Houston Astros World Series. Any comments, Gary? Minus the trash not- cans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the answer to that would be uh, that would certainly get some of the highest ratings out there. Clearly, there's a lot of animosity between the organizations over what happened. I guess that was, what, 2018, I guess it was. Um, you know, I, 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 I kind of I feel the Dodgers are the best team. I think that, you know, if you, if you, if you run out there, it isn't even including Kershaw when you think about this for a second. You probably run Scherzer out first, Urias or, or Bueller second, and then the one that's not pitching second, third. Uh, you know, that's – and he can bring David Price if he makes the postseason roster out of the bullpen or even to start. I mean, that's – if they can hit the ball, which they've been doing here in September. I mean, they had a great September, and so did the Giants. If they, have a, if they, if they hit the ball like they did in September, and now with the speed of Turner at the top, I mean, if it, I, I kind of expect them to go pretty deep here, and, and I guess I'd probably pick them to win it. In the, in the Houston case, I mean, you know, a lot of the people that were still there, you know, Correa – and others are still on the team. And they're not getting as much attention lately as they did a few years ago, you know, with Springer leaving and going to Toronto. But, I mean, they pretty much took a hold of that division. The A's pulled close a little bit in the summer, but they took a hold of that division and they held it for a very long time. And they're probably under the radar, strangely enough. So I don't think that's a far-fetched – you know, I think a wild card one game doesn't really hurt the Yankees or the Red Sox, but I'm not sure, in my judgment at least, that those teams are good enough to go deep into the – into the postseason. I think Chicago and Houston and Tampa are better. You know, I don't see any reason why Houston couldn't dump the White Sox. I mean, a lot of the White Sox players are good. They have a lot of power, but they haven't been here before. And that includes some of the pitching staff. So I think that the reality is that I think Houston has a good shot at that. But I think the Dodgers, to me, seem like the best team top to bottom. And if all goes well, and assuming all factors are equal, I would expect them to, 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 to possibly lift the, lift the title again. Sal from Germantown, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the show, uh, Sal. Thanks for listening. Sal says that they are ready to run Ben Simmons completely out of the state. It looks like the organization has used a bulldozer on him. I think he can still contribute here. Any thoughts? An NBA question. I mean, ben I'm, Simmons I'm with the as, Sixers. I'm not as – I mean, I, I do – I live in the, I live in the city now, so I know this, the drama that, uh, you know, the, the, the caller or the, or the emailer is referring to. I mean, it's it's a it's it's a it's a difficult situation all around. I mean, I, I do think, I mean, Simmons is is what six nine, six ten. I mean, he can he he can move the ball around to his teammates. You know, he's a very fine defensive player. Everybody has seen nationally his problems with free throw shooting and even you know shooting in general. But the fact of the matter is, is 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 the guy's still a top flight athlete. But for for one reason or another. He simply just doesn't want to be here, he keeps saying. So he puts the Sixers in a very difficult position. Obviously, if they try to move him, they're going to demand a lot. And I think with this situation, the way it unfolded, I'm not sure organizations are going to offer as much to the GM and Rivers and everybody else as they should. The fact of the matter is, though, that I think I think if he I think if I don't understand why he won't come in and play and play well, and then all of a sudden the situation would, if he wanted something like that, it would happen. I do still think he contribute, can contribute to somebody. I think without it, I don't think the Sixers are as much of a force as they were even last year. So, you know, it's a very, very, very difficult situation all around. I think Philly's a tough town. People take stuff personally. They don't, they don't forgive. It's going to be a very difficult situation for Simmons if he did come in and did start to play. And if he goes somewhere else, it, it, he'll continue to be enemy number one like some others have been in the past. I have another question, a boxing question from my son. The Canelo, Canelo Alvarez, Caleb Plant fight November 6th. Any thoughts on that? I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think Plant is probably, you know, your son's a, a pretty deep boxing follower because if you said Caleb Plant to the majority of sports fans across the country, unfortunately, they probably wouldn't have any idea who he is. This is a very fine fighter, though, that has worked his way up the old-fashioned way. He's pretty much taken on anybody he could, anywhere he could early in his career. You know, if, 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 if those who like boxing have seen some of the pictures, he clearly is a lot taller. And he's probably going to have a longer reach at the end of the day than Alvarez will. I don't know the exact numbers, but if you look at the size of the two in the face-off pictures as the promotional tour is gone, Alvarez is going to be in there with somebody a lot taller, a lot taller than uh, Gennady Golovkin was, 
a lot t- really Danny Jacobs is the only other middleweight who's been about the size and maybe even a little bit taller than Kayla Plant has that Alvarez has taken on recently. He did take on uh, one of the Smith brothers from over in um, in the UK, but he wasn't a hard hitter. Plant can hit a little bit more. Neither one's really a one punch banger. I have a feeling this punch this fight's rather going to have a lot of punches and a lot of action in it. I don't think Plant will come after Alvarez early because Alvarez is a pretty thick guy and he's pretty dangerous, has a ton of experience. But I think I give a slight nod to Alvarez in the fight. But I also think Plant's probably a pretty good live dog here. He's probably going to make the fight damn interesting, just like Billy Joe. He's not a southpaw like Billy Joe Saunders of the U.K. was in Canelo's last fight. Canelo there had a lot of trouble with the southpaw stance. He had a lot of trouble with uh, Saunders' length. Plant's conventional. He's right-handed, but he's going to pose the same problems for Alvarez, so it's going to be very interesting to see the way that develops. There is clearly, there's, I think there's some, again, non-feigned animosity, so real animosity. Plant felt that the negotiations were ridiculous one-sided, which often happens in boxing for the guy who is on the A side or holds the money train. Alvarez wanted him to take a really low payday. He wanted to fight where he wanted it, when he wanted it which he has the right to do because he holds some of the belts. But I think Plant really felt that some of the stuff was 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 really way too much and really was, I think, disrespecting him. And he showed it in the conversation. I mean, if you watch the sport long enough, you can tell when something is, you know, hyped to, to make money and something's real. And I, I think Plant's animosity here is real. That may or may not matter when you're talking about this level of fighter. But I think combined with that, combined with his clear size advantages and height and the fact that, you know, his resume – doesn't have a bunch of huge names on it, but that's the perverse part of boxing, unfortunately. He was good enough that he didn't bring enough money, but he was too good that or he was too good that he didn't bring enough money, but he was good enough that a lot of people didn't want to take his risk. Well, Alvarez didn't have a choice here because one of the ruling bodies that plants the belt, he had a fight plant. So sometimes, even though those ruling bodies are a scourge on boxing sometimes, sometimes they do the right thing, and I think for the sport they did here. There will be an interesting fight on November the 6th. Albert from Poway, California. Welcome to the show, Albert. Uh, Albert says that the Padres were a dumpster fire. Big changes need to be made. He says Tingler and Hosmer both need to go. Rumors are swirling that Manny Machado could go to the Mets. Any thoughts on that, on the San Diego Padres situation? Gary. I mean, I, I felt, I, I was just stunned, and I think uh, some of the references that the caller or the, the, the emailer made there, I, I would have to agree with. I mean, Around July 4th, the Padres looked excellent, you know, if you remember. I mean, that's not that long ago. And then they just completely fell. I mean, I know Tatis had some injuries in there, and that certainly hurt. And Snell, you know, Snell is a, is a very, very odd situation. I mean, the man has great stuff, but he just can't seem to make it past five and a third or six innings. And, you know, Machado, Machado is also a mystery. I mean, his numbers were very good again. And he was actually pretty good, you know, in the latter part of the season for them. But he has long stretches where he seems to kind of be invisible. And it's hard to figure out. So, I mean, as far as the Mets are concerned, I mean, the Mets are always a candidate for big names and making big changes because of, you know, the size of the market and probably the size of the wallet related to it. If I was the Padres, I mean, beyond disappointment, I guess it's what do you do now? Because when when you look at the roster that they put together, even picking up, Adam Frazier is maybe the best deadline deal on paper to play second base. The fact that they fell apart, and I, I guess they finished probably right at 500 or a little under 500. And they, they, you know, they just looked deader than life in some big games against San Francisco and even the Dodgers in September where, you know, you hate to say it, but you kind of wonder what's going on in between the, the ears there. I mean, that, that was the chance to kind of redeem a season a little bit and do some damage to one of those clubs, and they really did damage to neither so it's a very frustrating situation for the Padres fans, which had some friends out there years ago and did some business out there, and there's a passionate, poor following. And it's not necessarily realized by the national media, but they just can't seem to, to – they just seem to have a lot of bad luck going back to their, to their initiation in 1969. Another boxing question from my son. Uh, what are your thoughts on the retirement of the pride of the Philippines, Manny Pacquiao? I mean, it's a sad day, I think, for me. And I think, I mean, you knew it was coming. I mean, you know, the, the man's in his early 40s. The fact that his last few victories, uh, you know, against Adrian Broner, although Broner has clearly has some issues, a Cincinnati guy, but still a talented, fast-handed fighter, had been a four-division champion. His win against Keith Thurman was amazing. I mean, Thurman was at the peak of his career, really hasn't done much since. 
very close decision, and Thurman had his moments, but Pacquiao, I thought, did win that fight. I mean, I think the fight against Ugas was, you know, unfortunately in boxing, it just doesn't end very pretty. And watching that fight, Ugas is very long. He's very, uh, he's got very long arms. He's got a very heavy jab. He's from the Cuban, uh, you know, amateur system, which is sensational in boxing, and, and although it's declined a little bit internationally lately and been taken over a little bit by the Eastern Europe countries, but still, Cuban amateur boxing is still a major, major uh, funnel to the pro sport in America. Ugas is similar to Plant, a lot better than people realize, didn't get a lot of chances. He got this chance because of uh, the COVID-19 of Errol Spence, He's, who might be the best welterweight. Uh I mean, I hate to see Pacquiao go, but I'm kind of glad he's going before he really takes a horrible beating like some former champions have done. You know, Ali obviously is the one everybody talks about with Larry Holmes, but there's been plenty of others. Arturo Gatti, great name, took some beatings at the end of his career. You know, it, it, Pacquiao at least didn't take a horrible beating, although he clearly lost the fight. He looked a little slow and a little heavy-legged. But at 43, to be fighting at welterweight and an eighth division, I believe it was, world champion. I mean, we're just not going to see this again. And we're not going to see a guy have 62 victories either. I mean, it's just not the way the sport is. And, you know, with what we know about head injury and damage and everything else these days, and quite frankly, the money when you do get to the top levels, there's no reason to fight as long as Pacquiao did. Obviously, he just loved to fight. But, you know, he was somebody that you knew when you tuned him in. It doesn't matter what point you look at his career. You know, when he first started making all his fights against the great Mexican fighters in the early part of uh, this century, on into his, you know, wins over, you know, bigger guys like Miguel Cotto of Puerto Rico and Oscar De La Hoya, who may have been at the end, but still Pacquiao, the much smaller man. You just don't see this. I mean, Henry Armstrong would be probably the only comparable, you know, multi-division champion, but Armstrong didn't fight in eight divisions, and he didn't fight as long, nor as effectively over, he fought for a long time, but I mean, Pacquiao's resume is pretty much untouchable. If he's not a, a, a 100% ballot to the Canastota Boxing Hall of Fame in America, there ought to be an investigation in my view. Michael from Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, thanks for listening. First-time listener, he says, keep up the great work. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, now, Michael says that the Pittsburgh Steelers need to sit Big Ben Roethlisberger and bring in Aaron Rodgers, who has indicated he would not mind being in Pittsburgh next year. What, watch out. What are your thoughts, uh, Gary, on the Pittsburgh Steelers, Ben Roethlisberger, and uh, the possibility of Aaron Rodgers coming to Pittsburgh? <laughs> I'm not doing any shameless promotion here, but I'm sure this may be discussed by uh, one of the podcasts on this network uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, I think, yeah, clearly uh, I did not get to see the game this past weekend. I read about it. There's certainly a lot of press out there about uh, Roethlisberger and the overall Steelers offense. They certainly do seem to really be struggling the last three weeks. I mean, Roethlisberger reminds me a little bit of Jim McMahon from the standpoint of he's taken a lot of punishment over his career. He's a very, very big man. So, you know, it's not that surprising to me that he's struggling a little bit, you know, with mobility in particular. I mean, he's not mobile, so they don't they can't beat somebody that way. He's got to stay in the pocket and find his receivers. And if he's not getting a lot of time where he's not mobile, it's a, it's a problem because the Steelers don't have that many burners, at least in my recollection. But you know, I think I won't be – I mean, Pittsburgh is certainly one of the best football markets in the country. It always has been. I mean, if you're a, if you're a top-flight player and you want to leave where you are, which it appears Rodgers did, then didn't, and who knows what will happen as this year goes on again. I mean, I think it's viable. I mean, I, you know, I don't know enough about the, the, the levels of salary cap and things that the Steelers have to deal with in order to be able to do that. I mean, they were very high on Mason Rudolph, but he seems to have fallen out of the conversation. So, uh, you know, I don't know what the plan will be for that. But, you know, football is a funny sport from the standpoint to me that, you know, you got a lot can happen over these 16, now 17 weeks. And plenty of teams that start out and have really bad, bad periods and turn it around. I mean, now that division's a, that division's a pretty good division with the Browns in it. Cincinnati's looked a little bit better here in the month of September. Uh, you know, it's going to not be easy to win that division like it's been sometimes in the past. But, yeah, I mean – Pittsburgh's got some challenges. I mean, you know, they they they, they clearly do. So, uh, the before we run out of time, time is flying by. We uh, talked on the phone where you and I are similar in age, and I'm uh, nostalgic for '70s MLB, especially. And um, you know, people talk about that. Uh, you know, the, the only team to have uh, four 20-game winners, including uh, uh, and 
well, Jim Palmer, Dave McNally, Mike Quayer, and Pat Dobson. We had Pat Dobson in Cleveland, and but I, I think all, all, you know, I think a lot, probably more about the infield. Brooks Robinson, Mark Belanger, Davey Johnson, Boog Powell. What are your thoughts on the 1966 to 1983 Baltimore Orioles? <laughs> I mean, personally, personally, you know, Peter. I mean, I think as you and I have discussed. <laughs> Growing up uh, north of Baltimore by about 90 minutes in central Pennsylvania, it was easier to get to Baltimore to see Major League Baseball often than it was in Philadelphia because of construction on the old Schuylkill Expressway for what seemed like an eternity in Philadelphia. So my brother or my dad and I would often make trips down to Baltimore. As great as the team was, Memorial Stadium was a big old barn. You could get a good seat pretty much anywhere day of the game. You could wake up at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and hey, let's go see the Orioles because the Tigers are in or the A's are in or whatever, even the Yankees in those days. And, you know, they probably drew about 28, 29,000 a night. Place held 50,000. You could get you could get a good seat anywhere. I mean, I, I was fortunate to see, I think what made me love the game of baseball more than anything beyond its history was, the, was watching those Orioles teams and how good they were. I mean, beyond the starting pitching and an underrated bullpen with guys like Pete Rickert, and Mo Drabowski, Dick Hall, guys like that. But that infield and that up-the-middle defense, Echebarren, Andy Echebarren and Elrod Hendricks, Paul Blair in center field, and then Al Bumry and Rich Coggins split it for a while until Bumry took over. But the defense from Robinson to Belanger to even Davey Johnson, then to Bobby Gritch, then to Rich Dower, and even Boot Powell and Eddie Murray, they caught everything. They didn't make any misplays. You know, the, the the defense up the middle, Blair, Belanger, and the second baseman, even some of their pitchers were good fielders. They were just excellent defensive teams. They ran the bases. They weren't big speed teams, but they ran the base as well and didn't make many mistakes. In the field, they always threw the ball to the right base. Their pitchers were always ahead in the count. The Ray Miller was there. The work fast, throw strikes, change speeds. The Orioles certainly did that in those days. And they had just they had they had enough power and good power particularly in 69, 70, and the early 70s, that if you made a mistake late, starting pitchers in the game later in those days, or even bullpens a little bit weaker, you made a mistake, you generally were going to beat you with a two-run or three-run home run, Earl Weaver's favorite favorite hit, as he said. And although they didn't win that many World Series, look at the amount of games that they won. I mean, they won 100 games, I think, four or five times over that period. And every single every single game – that they were they were in it, they generally found a way to win it by something small. Moving a runner over, sacrifice fly. They were just excellent teams to watch. They made you appreciate how difficult baseball was, and they did all the little things that matter over the course of the season to win, in my mind. And, uh, what are your thoughts on the Los Angeles Dodgers of that uh, same era? Well, I mean, it's funny. You know, I, I was looking at the pennants uh, when we talked about this in the past, you and I. I mean – what an era of dominance. I mean, the Dodgers' three pennants, the Phillies' three division pennants, the Kansas City Royals' three division pennants, the Yankees' three pennants and two World Series, Cincinnati, five pennants, two World Series, Pittsburgh, six pennants, two World Series, Oakland, five, three straight World Series, and Baltimore from 69 to 79, five pennants and one World Series. I mean, those Dodger teams in the 70s, were excellent teams, but the Reds were so good in that period from 75, 76, uh, in that two-year period, that those Dodger teams, if they didn't have to play the Reds, probably would have won a lot more pennants as well. I mean, think of that team, how good it was. Joe Ferguson, who was a pretty good power hitter and could drive in a lot of runs, really couldn't even get a job on those teams. You know, Steve Yeager handled most of the catching. Johnny Oates was the platoon guy. I mean, Garvey, nobody knew anything about Garvey. He was a horrible third baseman. The simple move of moving him to first base. All of a sudden, you have the pressure of throwing the ball into right field all the time. He drove in all those runs. Davey Lopes could beat you any way. He could beat you with a home run. He had a kid over 20 homers a couple times. All those steals and those steals consecutively. Russell wasn't the greatest shortstop, but he had better range than given credit for. And Say, although he didn't look the part, also a very fine third baseman. And the corner outfielders, the Reggie Smith, the Dusty Baker, Rick Monday up the middle. I mean, those teams were sensationally good. They didn't win as much as they probably should have, but they had a great run there, particularly from that 1974 through 78 period. They, they just unfortunately ran into a, a slightly better Yankees team two of those seasons. 
Our guest has been Gary Ken, who has a wealth of knowledge in boxing and especially MLB and NHL. Uh, the time has flown by, Gary. Any any final thoughts for our audience? I mean, I, I, I've examined some of the questions. I think uh, boxing's in better shape. I've said this on some other things I've been uh, working on recently. Although it doesn't get the same media coverage because there's just so many sports that are covered today with the addition of soccer and even the other sports that, you know, I think boxing doesn't get the same attention. But boxing's in very good shape. And I think the fight on October 9th this Saturday is a very important one in the history of boxing. So those you like it, this one, there's, there's a good heavyweight undercard, too, on this one, which is rare anymore for boxing and one of the things that hurts it. But there are three fairly important heavyweight fights on the undercard on this pay-per-view. I won't go into the names now because of time, but this one's actually the old Don King style. There's a number of good heavyweight fights on the pay-per-view card. And I'm looking forward to the baseball postseason. I think, it, you know, we've never had a, we've never had a postseason where we've had two teams as good as the Dodgers and Giants were consistently all year. One may not even make it there. We've had the hottest team in September in its history in the Cardinals going in. And clearly we've got, got some repeats in the AL, Pete Winters. Uh, you got the unheralded Tampa, and obviously, you know, one of the two famous franchises in the AL is going to go out tonight. So looking very much forward to the postseason. Well, this has been a wonderful, wonderful interview, uh, Gary. Thank you so much for your insights on uh, especially boxing and MLB. And thank you, dear listeners, for, your, for, all your, for, for listening and for your very good questions. Next week we have James Donaldson again, who played in the NBA from 1980 to 1993 and has written a book about overcoming uh, severe depression. So that will be just wonderful to have him on again. Dear listener, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night, everybody. Thanks again, Mr. Gary Kinn. Thank you, Peter, for having me. Oh, thank you.